You're going to hear more from Liz tomorrow, but I couldn't resist the opportunity. So keep those yellow sheets handy because as you're thinking about the specific campaign that you and your home community may want to engage in, whether it's one of the three that we've already started to think through or a campaign around a different issue of the urgency of now and vulnerable folk among us, you're going to now hear from four transformational leaders who themselves are movement building. Not by themselves, but in relationship in a variety of ways have created a network of people to take action and build collective power to covenant together to fight for justice. So be thinking about the commitments, the leadership team that you'll want to assemble when you get home, the concrete steps that you'll need to take as you hear the stories, not just about the issues and the people that these inspired leaders will talk about, but also how they did it. So without further ado, let me introduce you to some of my heroes. Ari Ne'eman. Ari Ne'eman is a renowned leader. He has been so in the disability rights community for years. Currently, he's the CEO of MySupport.com, which is an online platform connecting people with disabilities to support workers. He has served as one of President Obama's appointees to the National Council on Disability and as the president and the co-founder of the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network. He advises the ACLU on disability policy and Medicaid. He has long been a friend and a partner to the Religious Action Center of Reform Judaism and our own advisor for disability rights, Lynn Landsberg. He knows the reach and the potential of the Jewish and broader faith community and what we can do within the walls of our institutions and beyond into the secular communities we find themselves. Let's celebrate the presence of our good friend, Ari Ne'eman. Megan Black is the national clergy organizer with the PICO National Network. Megan holds a Master of Divinity from Vanderbilt Divinity School and has years of experience as a community organizer uh, and in faith-based justice leadership and interfaith engagement. As the national clergy organizer, she has helped lead PICO's clergy training and formation initiatives, develops and sustains religious partnerships and integrates clergy, religious leadership, and theological framing into PICO's national campaigns. Megan has been an invaluable asset to our many rabbis and lay leaders who are working through their synagogues to protect people at risk for deportation, to make our criminal justice system more just, and to fight the ongoing challenges of racial inequality. Let's celebrate the presence of Megan Black. And by the way, how many of you were with us for Nitzavim in North Carolina last summer? So you already heard the great Megan Black once. You're in for a treat. Isabel Rose. How many of you read Isabel's Ro Isabel Rose's letter to Ivanka Trump? <laughs> then you know you are, and if you haven't, they're going to be on their smartphones now, like just trying to catch up. Um, the viral letter to Ivanka Trump that Isabel Rose published in Harper's Bazaar earlier this year, urging the president's daughter and advisor to advance protection for transgender students. It also placed Isabel at the forefront of trans activism. If you read the New York Times profile of her that appeared exactly one month ago, you'll know that Isabel's activism on behalf of her young trans daughter, Sadie, has been strengthened by the community her family has at our own Central Synagogue in Manhattan. Isabel is the founder of Woke Nation, an activist group dedicated to overcoming divisiveness fostered by fear-mongering, and she serves on the boards of the Family and Gender Project at the, American, at the Ackerman Institute and is a spokesman for the Family Equality Council. Isabel, up until her activism, was a very accomplished performer and artist. Let's celebrate Isabel Rose. And many of our rabbi, Rachel Timoner. We would not have a Reform California if it were not for Rabbi Rachel Timoner. And 
I'm sure she's watching on live stream right now, Rabbi Stephanie Colin. My friend and colleague, who is now the senior rabbi at Beth Elohim in Brooklyn, Rabbi Timoner has launched a variety of community organizing and social justice initiatives at her many years at CBE. How long has it been? Yeah, almost two years. So there, she's been busy. Um, as they together are working on dismantling racism and in partnership with New York City Council member and active reform Jew, Brad Lander, hashtag get organized BK, through which thousands of New Yorkers work together to defend democracy and human dignity. When she was the associate rabbi of Leo Beck Temple in Los Angeles, she was active in forming Reform California and helped us win key victories like the big fight for immigration reform there. So I'm going to ask each of our distinguished panelists to take a moment and reflect on kind of the why. Why they do this work, why it's deeply related or rooted in their faith, why they believe that the faith community, whether it's the Jewish community or the community beyond the Jewish community, is a critical lever for social change, and whatever else you want to share as you inspire this group of leaders that you've seen is quite inspired and ready to get into this fight. So Ari Ne'eman, would you start with why you do this work and why it's rooted in your faith tradition and your Jewish community? Absolutely, and first let me just say I'm, I'm humbled to be here um, both as an activist and as a Jew, um, and uh, I look forward to continuing a dialogue with all of the people here, especially um, you, Megan. My own congregation in D.C. recently decided to get involved in the Sanctuary Congregation Movement, and uh, I look forward to hearing more from you about how we can be a force on that. Um, at a personal level, my involvement in disability rights activism um, began in the most personal way. You know, whenever I talk about my work, I, I always, uh, specifically to Jewish audiences, I always try and work in that not only am I somebody who ran a nonprofit organization for 10 years and was a presidential appointee, but um, I'm also a Solomon Schechter dropout and a Camp <laughs> Ramah expellee. Um, well, and regrettably, both of those are for reasons related to the Jewish community often struggling to include youth with disabilities. Um, and so, um, you know, uh, my initial involvement in activism was about fighting for my own opportunity to be included as an autistic young person. Um, and, you know, really the experience of fighting for the chance to go to my local neighborhood school um, as opposed to uh, an inferior special education school an hour and a half away. And other similar experiences um, caused me and a number of other um, autistic people uh, to feel that there was a need to change the national conversation on autism, um, which, as in many other sectors of the disability community, um, was very much a conversation about us without us. Um, there was a heavy emphasis on focusing on the perspectives of parents and family members who are important allies but often have a very different view than those of us on the autism spectrum ourselves. Um, and um, also uh, a very strong, often paternalistic approach in many of the ways that service provision was delivered um, and an expectation that people with disabilities belonged in separate settings rather than inclusive ones. Um, so over the last 10 years, and I stepped down from that role in December um, to take on a new one at my support, but over the last 10 years, I worked to build the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network, um, which was designed and has really served and continues to serve as an instrument for autistic people ourselves um, to uh, have our voices heard in the halls of power. Uh, and I have to tell you, even though it's very much a secular um, area of advocacy, very secular public policy issues around healthcare, education, housing, other areas, um, for me, it's always been very informed by my Jewish experience, both the areas in which the Jewish communal world needs to improve around disability, but also this underlying concept, not just of tikkun olam, because everybody knows about tikkun olam, but also um, the idea 
that when we devalue somebody's personhood, when we say that people with disabilities do not have the same rights, or when we treat people with disabilities as, as objects or props for the inspiration or the education of the non-disabled population, that that is a chilul Hashem. Al tifrosh mina tzibur. You know, that's something I grew up learning. Don't separate yourself from the community. That's a Jewish concept. Um, and so... For me, you know, when I advocate for the inclusion of people with disabilities, uh, it's very much rooted in the values um, that uh, I, I received growing up as a Jew, even a Jew who wasn't always welcome in Jewish communal spaces. So, um, you know, I very much consider my advocacy work motivated by my faith. Is the mic on? Ooh, this is nice. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, so I, my organizing um, has become my, my source of liberation. Uh, and I organize because it's how I found my story. Uh, so I was raised, I'm mixed race. I was raised uh, in Iowa in an all-white community as the only person of color. And nobody knew how to tell my story um, growing up. Everyone knew how to tell their own, which was this German-Irish beautiful thing, um, but nobody knew how to tell my story. And so when I um, got into college, uh, what I found instead was the story of my faith. And I'm going to betray myself as a bit of an outsider. I'm a Roman Catholic, born and raised, um, and I went to a Catholic university. And I, it was while I was in college that I discovered my faith as a story that I could claim as my own because I, I couldn't tell the story of my race, I couldn't tell the story of my ancestry. Um, and so I, I cleaved to my faith, as it were. And then I had an experience in South America during my you know, customary study abroad semester um, and encountered my Catholic faith as uh, more than just a really good you know, moral narrative, as also complicit in um, evil and in empire and in terrorism and had to come face to face with the fact that there was um, an aspect to the story that I was claiming that I could not be proud of, that I had to own, and that uh, sparked kind of a, a, f a form of guilt in me, a form of um, a need to confess, a need to repent. And so I decided coming out of college to, uh, to both find myself as a woman of color, as a Midwesterner, um, and as a Catholic who carried both the kind of guilt of what Catholicism has done in this world, in Latin America and in other parts, um, and also the promise of my faith, which I find really beautiful. And so, um, so it was actually in an interfaith space. This is why I love interfaith organizing. I was working at Interfaith Youth Corps in Chicago. Are there any IFYC alums in here? Okay, there's a few. So I was working at Interfaith Youth Corps in Chicago, and I'd studied theology in undergrad, so I thought I knew what I was talking about, and I had been you know, baptized and confirmed in all the things that Catholics do to tell you that you're a good Catholic. And, uh, and we would be sitting in staff meetings, or I'd be meeting with Alana Konarski, who is one of my um, coworkers, and we'd be talking about the work that we were doing in colleges and in other parts of the um, organization, and they would be asking me to contribute, like give us the Catholic perspective, because here's the Jewish, and here's the uh, Muslim, and here's the Sikh, and the Jain, and the Hindu, what's the Catholic? And I was like, ooh, I don't, I don't know the seven principles of Catholic social teaching, or I don't know this, or I don't know that. And it was my Jewish colleagues, and my Muslim colleagues, and my Hindu colleagues who would step in and say, oh, well, we know. And they would tell me, <laughs> they would tell me about my own faith. And I realized I still don't have the story of my faith. And in order for me to really know the story of my faith, I have to know the story, I have to know other people's stories because they know mine and it feeds them and, and, it, and it communicates to them. And, and so I found myself learning more about other traditions, religious traditions, spiritualities, um, in pursuit of my own, in pursuit of my own story. 
And then, by happen chance, it was completely by accident that I got into organizing. I knew that I wanted to be in the nonprofit world. I knew that I cared about these issues. Um, but I also knew I was leaving Chicago, and I just happened upon this job in Kansas City, Missouri, that turned out to be a job with the Pico National Network, who's my current employer. And it was about organizing, it was about justice, it was about community transformation um, on behalf of those who are most marginalized. And, um, and it was in those spaces around people of color, around the poor, around formerly incarcerated and currently incarcerated, around immigrants, around those who don't speak English, that I found a space for me to discover my own narrative, tell my own story, um, which is also a story of marginalization and liminal spaces. And so I organize because it is, it's how, it's how, I, it's how I know myself. And I find that the people that I organize with, which now includes everyone in this room, are the best people I've ever met in my life. <laughs> and I want to be more like them, and so I do this so that I can be more like the people I want to be like. So, and let me, if I have a few more moments, I wanna say, so the question of why social justice matters to people of faith or what it is about our faith that inspires us, um, <clears throat> I think a lot about imagination and the supernatural, and I think that faith environments, that communities of faith have, um, were predisposed to be more accommodating to the idea of the supernatural, right? Like I think about Moses in the burning bush. Moses comes across this burning bush, bizarre, totally weird, like what's going on here? And the burning bush says to him that the plight of your people is misery. And I know I'm speaking to a bunch of rabbis, so you guys can tell me later that I'm messing this up. But, <laughs> but he, that the plight of your people is unjust and that actually what there is for you is a land flowing with milk and honey and that you have a mandate to do that. And, and I think about that encounter with the supernatural, that recognition that the plight of, that what you, your ordinary, what's normal to you is actually not right for you, and this is what's right for you, this land of milk and honey, and you, you are now required to do whatever it takes to get you to that land, that's a, that's a remarkable, like, thought pattern, a, a remarkable conclusion to reach, and we reach it by faith. And so when I think about why we do this as people of faith, it's because there were burning bushes and we listened to them and they took, they took us to lands of milk and honey and this is what we're doing today. So we'll probably come back to that, but I'm done. <laughs>
as I went to and fro the freshman comment. Are there any Yaleys in here? Okay. Um, there were all of these radicals who were in shanty towns because they wanted Yale to divest. And I thought, what do these people's parents think? <laughs> I mean, they, they're like, they're shouting, they're terribly rude, and they probably have to shower. Um, <laughs> I did not imagine that I was part of any sort of conversation of protest at all. I thought it was very um, aggressive and, and not Jewish. Like it was, you should be much more um, polite and diplomatic and sing. <laughs> so off I went to sing and I was an actress and I was a cabaret performer, and I married someone I met on J-Date, <laughs> and um, had my kids, and sort of, you know, I, I didn't even think I was part of a political conversation, really, despite my incredible Jewish justice life. Just, I think I just thought other people were going to manage that. <laughs> and then Donald Trump became the candidate for president of the United States. So I want to say straight off that I respect um, multiple political viewpoints, that I'm interested in talking across aisles, and that I'm always looking for nonpartisan conversations to have and ways to fight for justice in a nonpartisan setting. But since you did ask, <laughs> Um, I'm just going to say it straight out. I was absolutely horrified. So here was somebody uh, who had the most repulsive views on women, who was audaciously and proudly discriminatory, against the disabled, against the Muslim community, not disavowing the white supremacists, you know, who he, I think, didn't know who David Duke was, which is impossible, um, since he's, you know, self-proclaimed very smart. <laughs> so, um, I began to think, wait a second, um, oh, I'm on Facebook, and I usually post photos of, you know, my kids winning ribbons at you know, I don't know, whatever they're doing ribbons at. Maybe I'm going to find a community instead of people who are also horrified. And I began to think, as he chose, uh, let's shock them straight, Mike Pence, as his vice president, I began to think, oh my God, is anyone here thinking about Hitler, or is it just me? And. I will say, with total respect to my parents, who I couldn't love and adore more, they said, you've got to calm down. <laughs> you are hysterical. You have to stop posting on Facebook. People think you're unhinged. <laughs> so I founded a group called Woke Nation. Um, and I began to post there to look for community. And it felt very Jewish to me to find community because that's also what Jews do, is they just look for community because there's comfort in community and there's power in community and there's family in community in the event that your own family maybe isn't ready, willing or able to be that. So the he got elected, the women's march happened, I was kicking and screaming with the women. And then, I don't know if any of you watched Obama's farewell address when he said, if you're not happy with the state of things, uh, put on, lace up your boots, he said, and get in the game. So I thought, how can I get in the game? I mean, I'm just a person. I don't have a PhD in social activism. I'm not a rabbi. I have a nifty cordster. 
and I have a master's degree in fiction and literature, and, um, and uh, I'm comfortable in front of people. I'm not shy. And when the injustice reached my front door, I'm the parent of a transgender child, Sadie, when it knocked on the door, I thought, okay, wait a minute. Now, you know, now it's not even enough to be on Woke Nation. I, I, I have to actually do. I have to, you know, we talked about that in the very beginning. What does it mean to be holy? It's a do. What can I do? So I thought, okay, wait a minute. What I could do is try to change that hateful <laughs> law, that revision of protections for transgender students. If you, if you revoke the protection of trans, if, if transgender students can't use the bathroom of their choice, you are actually not recognizing their existence. I'm positive my daughter exists because I gave her breakfast this morning. <laughs> Child exists. I thought, wait, I, I, I can write, I can, I'm, I'm, and I'm a mother. Oh, I have that in common. Oh my God, Ivanka Trump and I have something in common. I'm going to talk to Ivanka. We're going to go mother to mother here. And um, because of that desire to do and give myself permission, which also feels very Jewish to me, it's like, you know, Moses gave himself permission I mean, to literally walk through a, a desert, you know, with a, a staff in a bush and milk and honey at the Starbucks down the road. Um, I consider it entirely intertwined. When, when the injustice feels too close, every Jew, every person of any religion has been the subject of persecution. It's just our mandate. And so it feels exciting to um, not be singing on a stage anymore, but to be doing something uh, purposeful as this is a state of crisis. Um, I was born in and grew up in Miami, Florida. Um, Florida. Um, and I was born in 1970, so not that long after Jim Crow. My parents were New Yorkers, and so I was raised on stories of what it was like to live in Florida during Jim Crow, and um, how, as Jews, we stand with the oppressed. That was like the milk I was raised on. That was, the, that was the foundation of our identity. I remember in 1980, a man named Arthur McDuffie was killed by police, an African-American man in Miami, and there was a riot. And we were living at that time in Coconut Grove on a, in a tall building, and I could see from the window, I could see the fires. And I was 10, and I remember being afraid of those fires. But I also remember knowing that the people who were out there were right. There was a woman who worked in our house whose name, was, um, who, whose name was Clara Watson, and she helped clean our house and took care of me sometimes. And one time we went to, I always saw her at my house, and one time we went to see her at her house, and I was stunned. I had no idea that we lived in two completely different worlds that never touched. And so those were formative experiences for me that made me understand that the world that I lived in was profoundly unjust. And that racism was at the root of so much that was broken in our society. I went off to college, I went to Yale, and Yale is a castle. And in the, in the, uh, in the late 80s, early 90s, New Haven was devastated. And um, I knew then that I was gonna be dedicating my life to social justice, no question. And some of the foundational ideas, you know, I think about God speaking to Cain and saying, your, blood, your brother's blood is crying out from the ground to me. And I think about how we're commanded to not stand idly by the blood of our neighbors. And how we're even commanded not to remain indifferent 
when our neighbor is suffering a much more minor problem. And that Rashi says that what it means to be indifferent would be to cover our eyes and pretend we do not see. And so um, I dedicated my life at a young age to social justice work long before I had a clue that I might ever be a rabbi. That was definitely not in the cards. And, um, but what happened as I was doing justice work f with my whole life was that I realized I needed something deeper to tap into to sustain myself. There was no way I was gonna last. And I needed God. And I needed, needed tradition. And I needed my people. And I needed to come at universal concerns from a particular place that's rooted in text and values and a long history. And that, in a very long way that I won't tell you, led me ultimately to the rabbinate where I could combine what's become for me a, an overriding need and practice to connect to spirituality and God and the source of life and also to continue to dedicate myself to make, making the world more whole. So I'm, I'm noticing this beautiful common theme uh, that Rabbi Timoner, I think, lifted up, which is the gap between that deep place of strength and inspiration, the place of community and God and faith, and the disruption of that the threat to that because of some either external assault to it by an elected person or by a policy or, or, or. So, Megan, can we go back to you to return us to the moment at the bush because that embodies the gap between the reality people find themselves in, which is a, a reality of suffering, but somehow having the courage or the faith to see beyond. So I want to turn it to you next because you had more to say on the subject, so I want to invite you to say more. And then I'll turn it to the rest of the panelists to think a little bit tactically about how you have overcome the challenge of the reality of the thing that you were up against or felt up against and how you actually organize the community to get back with your people, your God, your faith, to actually move and make change. So, Megan, would you start? Yeah. So when I was thinking about the... Um, what Moses imagined with the help of God in the burning bush, this land of milk and honey, I was wondering what, did it, what is it that we imagine today? What's our land of milk and honey? And so in my work with Pico, Pico is a, a network made up of um, something like, well, we're across 20, 40-something federations, so local organizations. Some of you are probably affiliated with a Pico Federation. Um, and so the, the local federations do very local work. They, um, they organize in their communities to change policies, laws, practices that are keeping people oppressed, keeping people marginalized, keeping people poor, et cetera. Um, and so they're doing that work, but they're doing it as faith-based um, congregations. I'm just trying to figure out how to sit in this chair. They're doing it as um, faith-based congregations. And so they have both a really clear analysis and understanding of um, what's the actual experience of their people. Um, they're close to the struggle. They're close to the pain. What, what does it mean for someone to be formally incarcerated and unable to find housing and a job and get a car and has no transportation? What does it mean for your community to be um, serving or, or among undocumented immigrants, et cetera. Um, and they, so they're, they have this kind of day-to-day -day awareness of, of what's actually happening. And also their faith demands that they imagine what could be different. And so when I think about what is it that I'm imagining for, for the people that I care about, I think about something is, and I love the word radical recently, so I, I'm sorry if I use it too much. I'm like really hung up on what it means to be radical. Um, what, what, does re, what does a conversation on reparations look like in this exploitative capitalist economy? Like, what does it look like for us to be doing right by the black and brown persons that we have mistreated and maltreated for so long? Um, what does it mean for us to be doing sanctuary, to not accept that we can just deport people regardless of circumstance, um, and, and to actually call on congregations to live up to this idea that their, that their temple or their church is a sanctuary. We use that word. We use the word sanctuary to talk about going to, going into those spaces. What does it mean to actually invite 
people who don't normally show up but who are in desperate need of that, like physical, bodily need of that into those spaces. So I wanted to, when I was thinking more about the burning bush, it's the question for me is, how are we as people of faith today imagining the milk and honey that our people need? Because it's not, it's not Canaan, that's, that's been and done, that's, that's Hebrew scriptures. Now it's, it's, it's whatever, it's whatever is, a, is the immediate response, what, whatever, let me find my words. It requires a radical imagination of us to see what it is, what is hurting our people and what will, um, what will liberate them. So I'll leave it there. Beautiful, yeah. beautiful, thank you. Um, Ari Naman, um, as a practical example, the network you built over the last decade started relatively small and you built it into quite a significant and substantial network. What learnings can we have about how to operationalize the need to build community and the need to be rooted in a faith that it can be better with actually building something? So I think it's a, one of the most difficult questions out there, the, the tactical one, because you know, frankly, so often the conversation on activism focuses on the why um, and not the how, um, and it often leads people with the um, very mistaken impression um, that uh, the job of an activist is to be right about a lot of different things. Um, and that's, that's really not true. Um, you know, in fact, a, a considerable percentage of the role of an activist is the same as um, the role of you know, anyone else who's tasked with building new infrastructure, be it in you know, uh, business or the nonprofit sector or social services. Um, but there is this added element of needing to um, learn how to wield power and to be comfortable with it um, and to be comfortable with the idea that um, we are sometimes going to be using very collaborative methods to promote change and sometimes going to be using more confrontational methods to promote change. Um, so, um, you know, uh, getting down into the weeds a little bit, um, I, I think one of the big challenges um, that we faced in the autistic community, and I think it's very similar to um, a challenge that the Jewish community often faces, um, is how can we um, build a certain level of um, awareness of our issues um, as more than just bad things that are happening um, akin to you know, the weather or some other natural disaster that we can't do anything about to shifting towards a political understanding of our problems. Um, so, <laughs> speaking of things we can't do anything about. What? Well, hold on, because hold on, Ari, Ari, Isabel Rose will get her nifty chord stir out and start singing, Don't let the light go out. <laughs> it's lasted for so many years. So. <laughs> wow. <laughs> You're that good, man. It's not even Hanukkah. <laughs> Um, so that question of how we build political, political awareness is, is a really critical one. Um, and one of the first things we realized um, was that um, it's actually sometimes very useful to focus in on the areas of greatest controversy, um, even if uh, there is at times a certain degree of friction there, um, in part because in disability contexts, and I think this is the case in other contexts as well, um, we run into this problem that people think the only problem that people with disabilities face is um, a world that uh, doesn't care enough as opposed to a world that sometimes doesn't care in the right ways. Um, you know, uh, there's a long history of disability services um, being delivered in ways that end up isolating people with disabilities from the community. Um, the, uh, the history of institutionalization in this country, and it's noteworthy that at one point three in every thousand Americans was institutionalized in the, 20th, in the middle of the 20th century. Um, you know, the history of um, a great deal of disability services infrastructure um, that was built with the best of intentions, 
many kinds of group homes, sheltered workshops, um, facility-based day programs that were built during another set of to another time with a different set of expectations for people with disabilities. That now, as we move towards a model that's more about in integration and more about inclusion, we realize we, we actually can do better. We can support people in the same kinds of homes in the same neighborhoods and the same kinds of jobs and the same kinds of recreational activities and the same kinds of schools as people without disabilities. Um, those are the controversial issues in our community and it's important that we tackle them specifically because they help us um, move the ball forward when the discussion isn't just about how much money can we can we get? That's important, but how much? But it's not just an appropriations discussion. But instead, it's getting at the core issue, which is: Is our society ready to recognize people with disabilities as full members of our community and as present? velo um, bechesed by right and not by charity. That's the motto of one of the great Israeli disability rights organizations, Bishut. Um, and, and so, you know, I really actually encourage activists in whatever sector you're in um, to recognize that sometimes, it's always, this isn't always the case, but sometimes the best tactic is not to go for the low hanging fruit. It's specifically to zero in on the area um, of greater controversy because it sends a message um, that, uh, 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 and asks everybody in the conversation to really define what their values are and where they stand in the broader conversation. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you, Ari. Very helpful. There is, there is an underlying tension that I want to kind of lift up for us to think about, and, and Isabel, I'm going to ask you to, to reflect next. The assumption underneath what you said, Ari, I think is that people have had good intentions, but maybe not helped the way that is helpful. That assumes that there's a community of people that has recognized, that has acknowledged, and maybe in a patronizing or condescending way, helped. What I heard Isabel say earlier is, my daughter doesn't exist. So I, I'm now thinking about the vulnerable communities, and it's not all the same, right? These are not all, these are diff, these are, and the letter that you wrote, I'm just going to read, if you don't mind, Isabella, a piece of the letter to Ivanka was, if you were me, you would be greatly dismayed if you found out that the government chose to rescind protections for transgender students that allow them to use the bathroom corresponding to their gender identity instead of their anatomy. Like me, you would look at the ultra-feminine, at your ultra-feminine eight-year-old standing on the street corner waiting for the school bus, her already elegant head held high, pink bow quivering in the wind, and you would say to yourself, what on earth will my little princess do if someone forces her to go to the bathroom with the boys? She'll be mortified. She'll be bullied. She'll be scared. Ivanka, put yourself in my Jimmy Choo's for a minute. What would you do if you were me? Because you have great humor. But what do we do when it's a real debate about whether people are trying to help or they don't believe that we exist? I happen to uh, recently be in a room with somebody. We'll just keep this conversation among us, yeah? You're on Facebook Live. <laughs> I had the great honor of having a private meeting with Secretary Betsy DeVos not long ago. We're on Facebook Live, okay? So, manners. <laughs> and um, just as I did when I wrote the letter to Ivanka, and I really thought hard, what on earth do I have in common with Ivanka? You know, what I, and by the way, I used Ivanka really to represent every mother everywhere. Everyone asks me, have I heard from Ivanka? It, it really probably isn't appropriate for Ivanka to, you know, give me a call, but I invited her for Shabbos. Um, <laughs> um, I haven't heard from Ivanka. I did hear from Cuomo, though, and I'm really proud um, that he really stands up for the, for the LGBTQ community. But anyway, DeVos. Um, so I'm always looking for a way to uh, find common ground. 
You know, the, the, um, I was just recently finished reading um, Ethics for a New Millennium, the Dalai Lama's book. Um, it's a wonderful, wonderful read where he says, you know, everybody has exactly the same desire in life. Everybody is looking for, um, you know, self-fulfillment and everybody wants safety. So two things. And that he calls for a, um, a revolution in ethics and a revolution in compassion. So I'm always thinking, how do we build compassion? You know, we don't need to be the activist that's screaming. We can really try to appeal to a common ground. You know, we all have a heartbeat. We all, you know, want to feel safe. So when I met with, um, to prepare for the meeting with, with um, Secretary DeVos, I researched her carefully. I saw that her family recently has given $6.2 million to conversion therapy. Um, and uh, I still had to show up in that room and try to find a way for her to hear me. And I, I discovered that she really, really believes in um, traditional family values. So I spent most of that meeting telling her that I grew up in an observant Jewish household that I actually attended, believe it or not, I attended a Protestant all-girls school. So I can say the Heshachachiyanu and I can say the Lord's Prayer, like, you know, the Birkat Hamazan and, and um, Our Father who art in heaven is the same, eyes closed. Um, that I went to Yale and didn't protest. I showered, you know, constant, was tidy. <laughs> I, I, um, I have a very traditional life. I have children. They all have a bedtime. They, we, we eat three meals a day. Um, it does happen that I have a transgender child, except we're tra we're, I have a pretty traditional transgender child. And I try to, you know, to reach out and say, for some reason, there's this bizarre idea that if you have a transgender, a gay, a, ch a child with a portal, by the way, a child on the spectrum, that um, maybe you're not traditional. I don't even, I can't understand why these connections are happening. So in answer to that question, how do we try to exist? We try to break down the barriers. And we try to get it as close as we can to um, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. You know, who are we? Some of us have one anatomy and some of us have another anatomy, but it doesn't, it's, that like doesn't matter, that's a window dressing. Um, and I think that is what everyone needs to do, you know, when they leave here, and I'm sure you're already doing it, so please just keep doing it. Please keep reminding everyone you know and your congregants and your neighbors that really, we are the same. So one of the things, I think, one of the things that we hear underneath that teaching is around being proximate. Um, we learned from Brian Stevenson at the last consultation that part of this kind of organizing and activism and advocacy is to be proximate to people um, so that we really learn from and grow from them. So um, Rabbi Timon, I'm going to give you the last full answer, and then I'm going to ask every panelist just to kind of say one last reflection before we conclude. We're a very diverse community. Um, we have Republicans and Democrats. Um, people voted both directions in the last election. Um, how do we maintain our commitment to being nonpartisan, um, to being political, but appropriately political, where we give voice to alternate views, where we foster civil discourse, and we commit to somehow getting proximate to those people we don't know and make us uncomfortable and move forward, be for something. That's easy, no problem. <laughs> um, and you have three minutes, oh, no, five. So, okay. go. Go. <laughs> um, the first thing I wanna say is that it matters to do this work in the context of synagogues. It matters to do this in the context of synagogues because the questions we're facing right now 
are moral questions. Yes, they are political, but they are mostly moral. They're about our deepest values, and we have a beautiful tradition that articulates those values very clearly. And so, um, and so I think it is possible to have conversations with each other that are based on listening and empathy and compassion and are also about what we stand for in the deepest sense of seeing the humanity in each one and honoring the dignity of each one. And within the context of a synagogue, we were the stranger. We know the story of the stranger. Um, but I hear you also asking, okay, how do we move forward and also reach across, whether in the synagogue or outside of the synagogue, to those who don't see this, the world, are not currently seeing the world in the way that we're seeing things. So two things, I, I think what we're doing at CBE, um, my congregation in Brooklyn, is we have this, this thing called the Get Organized Brooklyn, where we basically just opened the doors of the synagogue to anybody who felt like you described after the election, anybody who felt like, I have to do something. Because people want to be of use. People want to hear the sacred calling coming through them and to make their lives matter with what they do with their hands. And so we opened the doors and just said, come on in, we're gonna do this together. It doesn't matter if you're a member, it doesn't matter if you're Jewish, it doesn't matter. Come in and we're gonna do this. And 10,000 people at this point have come through and we have monthly gatherings averaging 1,000 at each time. One time we were 1,200 and a line for three blocks. Um, and we are 40 working groups and they're on all kinds of, you can choose what you want to work on and you can just gather with others and do it. So that's, that's one kind of going forward, but those are people who basically are agreeing with each other. Within that umbrella of the whole thing, we are saying, okay, how also are we gonna be better at listening to people who aren't on our page? And there is a model that we've been looking at a lot, a kind of long form or deep canvassing work where you kind of go door to door. We did this, to, we did this, we did this with, with you guys, with the rack, yes. Hello, um, yes, and uh, we did it in Cleveland. We did it in Cleveland. We went with Dave Fleischer, yeah. And, um, and so we are, we, Dave just came to visit us. We're training a bunch of our people in that work. We're thinking about basically what you do is you, I should explain, we, you, go to the, you, go to, you go to door knocking, and instead of just saying, you know, will you vote for so-and-so, or do you stand for such and such, you listen. You listen, tell me, tell me, tell me why you voted for Donald Trump. Tell me, what, what was that about for you? What did that mean for you? I wanna understand. And we're looking for forums like that, and we're looking for other kinds of forums where some of these 10,000 people, because we've got a lot of people, some of them can focus on that kind of work. Um, and in districts outside of our district where there you know, are a lot more, where we are, there's not that many Republicans. You know, in other districts there are. And to go and to form relationships there, because ultimately we realize, and this is a key thing that I think I wanna say, is that I really believe in doing work at the state level. I really do. I know that federal level is important too, local level is important too. Um, and, I, and I worked on that in California, and I, and I, I wanna be working that more, more in New York. And I, I, so that means you have to go into districts um, you know, where not everybody agrees, and many of you are from places like that, so you know better than I do. But, um, but I, I, I think that um, what we're working on is thinking about how do you do that kind of listening and that kind of relating that is deeply humble and, and, um, and centered in compassion and, the, and with the confidence that we can find each other, like the trust, the faith, the faith that we can find each other, that if we listen with an open heart, we can find the heart of the other. We're, we're, ju we're just at the end, so in a minute I'm going to ask each one of you in a sentence or two, having heard the group and know what we stand for and what we're trying to do, a last reflection you would offer as your kind of farewell gift to this crowd. I will say, I'm not sure if Rabbi David Stern has arrived yet, the president of the CCR. Uh, folks here from Temple Emmanuel of Dallas, the congregation that uh, David serves, wonderful. So here's a wonderful story that I'll offer in closing as, as we, we invite the panelists. Uh, Rabbi Stern sat with some prominent um, leaders in the congregation, some Republican, some Democrat, and asked the question, are we for the stranger? And they said yes. And he said, are we for refugees? And they said yes. And he said, are we for immigrants as the people of immigration? And they said yes. 
And they started from that premise. And they said, so how will we be for immigrants and refugees? And they passed a board resolution. They're becoming a solidarity congregation. They didn't use the word sanctuary. The word sanctuary for that particular congregation was not the word that was going to be helpful. But they've developed a real robust strategy to be present and show up for immigrants and for refugees. So I think there are ways that we can create the kind of sacred conversations and really hear from people who we don't necessarily agree with uh, that can not only help us get something done, but actually model the kind of community that we want to be. So let me start with Ari, and we'll just go around the... So I, I, just, I guess I would just say in closing, um, there's a lot of really important work to be doing um, in, in the broader world of activism. But I, I would encourage, in addition to doing that, and you shall, all should be doing that, um, you'd ask yourself, how can we make our own community more inclusive and more welcoming? Um, for Jews with disabilities and many and many other categories of Jews who have been marginalized, LGBTQ Jews, uh, Jews of color, many, many others, um, there is, there's sort of a fundamental challenge in being treated as um, part of welcoming the other, because we're not the other. We're, we're, we're a part of the community. Um, and I know there's a lot of work to be done, but I, I, I ask you to go home and think about how you can challenge yourself to do more, to be more inclusive, and to reach out to Jews with disabilities and other marginalized Jews in your congregation and take your cue from us as to the mechanics, as to the specifics. We're very interested in going into the details with you, and we're looking forward to having that conversation. So thank you. Uh, I think I would, can I, can I grow on that? Can I add to that pyramid? Okay. Um, I think I would add that this is work that we do because it is ultimately for us, for all of us. Like we each have, a, everyone in this room I'm confident has a story to tell that's, um, that's worth hearing and that is actually can only be told though in relationship with others and in, in understanding who others are. And so the work of sanctuary or solidarity, the work of standing with our, um, our LGBT siblings, the work of standing with our siblings who have disability, um, that's all liberative work. It's all work that uh, unlocks our own freedom. It unlocks our own stories of self. Um, and so we don't do it simply because our God tells us to, or our, these are the morals and values that our tradition holds, but also because um, who we are as individuals and as a people is tied up in those stories. And so, um, so I say when we're organizing, when Pico, uh, when we do trainings, the, at the heart of all of our trainings is, um, is narrative, it's story, it's, it's coming to know who you are. So when I was first coming on board, people kept telling me, tell us your story, tell us, and it drove me nuts, because I was like, I'm from Iowa, like, what else, like, that's, <laughs> I have nothing else to tell you, I'm mixed race, blah, 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 I'm black. There's, 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 but then, as you keep on, as people keep asking, um, and as I, as I kept asking other people theirs, it brought to light my own, and, and it, it also, made my feet move. Like I had to act when I knew, when I knew how other people were struggling or other people were suffering. Um, I, had to, I knew that I had to show up for them if I trusted myself to ever show up for myself. Okay, so I'll pick up the ball. Um, Hineni, you know, I'm here, we're here. Um, by being here, by being mindful, by being um, open-hearted, I think you, this is going to sound very kumbaya, but we know what my upbringing was. Like, I, it, we're all a product of our background, so um, you can't, <laughs> can't blame me uh, for wanting to <laughs> hold hands and sing Shiva all the time. Um, we have this opportunity by being present to, um, to, to alter the energy um, between ourselves and whoever we're with. 
it's a, it's a really kind of basic thing. You know, when we talk about love, they're always saying, oh, it's chemistry. And I do believe in that exchange of, of um, I mean, really hokey would be love, but um, that, that this exchange of, of, of presentness, this, um, if we bring ourselves with great grace, with great humility, to our daily life, I mean to the encounter in the taxi and at the bodega and at a big conference, and try when we see or experience the other in any way to deal with our fear because the first thing when we see something that we're not um, prepared to see, and for instance in my own life it would be um, my young daughter Sadie in the nurse's office pulled down her pants one day because she had a, a rash and there was another little girl in that bathroom and uh, I got a call from the principal that this other little girl saw that Sadie had a penis and they rushed that little girl to the social worker so that she could be treated. And I said, well, is my kid okay? <laughs> um, I just kept thinking, gosh, maybe if we didn't get so fearful and hysterical when we encounter change and instead you know, we just take a moment and say, oh, all sorts of unexpected things. But there are burning bushes, and there is milk and honey, and there's penises where I didn't know there was going to be one. And it's a, <laughs> you know, I don't know, and that, that person has a vagina, and I mean, all right, you know, and on, I mean, stranger things have happened. <laughs> Here, Amy. Hineni and uh, we're in this for our own stories and we're in this for our own leadership and we need each other. We need each other so much right now. There are so many people who need you. And we need each other because it's about our own leadership and it's about finding and seeing each other's leadership and helping each other find our feeling of calling. This is what I have to give to the world and the world needs what I have to give. And I think this moment actually has tremendous opportunity in it because people are waking up. They're waking up, they're saying, I'm not gonna sit on the sidelines anymore. This is up to me, the urgency of now. And so we need each other. And so we come together in our gathering places, our Beit Knesset, Batei Knesset, and we use those places to find each other and become powerful. Thank you. Let's celebrate our wonderful and talented, inspired panel. There is no doubt that the single best way that we can thank these great leaders who are changing the world is by answering the question, how will we respond by saying hineni? What will we do? How will we say in our congregations, our community, and in our movement, hineni?